Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And dragons are quite possibly Skyrim's most iconic type of creature. Winged beasts that dominate the skies and served as one of the Elder Scrolls V's biggest selling points. Seriously, the marketing for these things was crazy. The Dovas of Tamriel are powerful, mysterious, and ancient creatures. Thought to have been extinct for the past few thousand years, they since re-emerged, seemingly out of nowhere during the height of Skyrim Civil War, with dark plans of conquest. Now, only you, the Dragonborn, a mortal who shares their type of soul, has the power to put an end to this terrifying scheme. There's also admittedly a nice dragon or two, but more on that later. Regardless of the morality, despite the incredible significance these flying lizards have on the game's narrative, there's still quite a bit about them that Skyrim purposely leaves vague, and there's a few strange things going on that even veteran players may not know. So today we'll be taking a look at five things you probably didn't know about the dragons of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, let's begin today by exploring a topic literally no one has an answer to. Where did dragons come from, exactly? Tez V tells us that for much of the Morethic and First Era, they ruled over the Nords of Skyrim, until basically being wiped out in an uprising. But where were they before then? Well, it's generally accepted that the Dovas are a creation of Akatosh, Adric God of Time, and as a result, experience and travel through time quite a bit different than most mortals do, which makes pinpointing an exact moment for their creation very tough. In a 2018 interview, some of the writers for the Elder Scrolls Online stated, quote, Dragons existed even before the inception of sequential time in the Dawn Era. The Dawn Era is basically Tez's version of prehistory. The concept of origination is hard to apply to the species. End quote. Okay, so we can't decide when exactly dragons came about, but we do know they were around quite a bit before human settlement of Skyrim. You see, the Nordic race began not on Tamriel, but instead on the ancient, now lost and unmapped, frozen continent of Atmora, that's said to exist somewhere north of Tamriel. Though, evidently, it experienced some type of great freezing and is now uninhabitable and nearly impossible to find. Well, various texts and books tell us that back when the Nords were still on Atmora, and when it was still inhabitable, way back thousands of years ago in the early Morethic era, many of these Nords were already worshipping dragons, among a few other animal pantheons. And when the people sailed to Skyrim, they seem to have taken the lizards with them. The lore is actually fairly clear that Atmora Nords had contact with dragons. It fails to make obvious exactly what that relationship looked like, were they already being ruled over by the dragons before they came to Tamriel? Or were the dragons just off doing their own thing and didn't become oppressive overlords until later on? We just don't really know. But we'll talk a little bit more about Atmora and Dover relations in a while. So basically, we don't know when dragons started, but apparently they were around on Atmora and came to Tamriel with Nords when they migrated. Okay, that's a fair enough history assessment. But Here's where things get a bit weird. They may have a connection to the also mysterious continent of Akavir, and that connection gets a little chilling when you examine it. Akavir, of course, is a massive continent said to exist to Tamriel's east that we know very little about already. It too has never been successfully mapped, and all records of it come from travels from thousands of years ago and other flimsy sources but it seems to be about the size of Tamriel, and home to all sorts of mythical beings. Well, the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind featured an anonymously authored book called Mysterious Akavir, which provided a very brief summary of what the place might be like. I say might because this book does appear to be very old and it's anonymously published, and the author's writing style is quite vague and ominous. So take it with a grain of salt. Regardless, according to Mysterious Akavir, Akavir's name really translates to Dragon Land. Aka being Old Marie for dragon, and Vir meaning land. 
The writing goes on to describe a number of the civilizations that are said to exist in this place, and when talking about a civilization of tiger folk that apparently inhabit the east of the continent, called the Kapo, the book suggests that these cat people are ruled by a giant dragon named Tosh Raka, which sounds a lot like Akatosh. And the description of this giant dragon provided also matches how Akatosh chooses to manifest physically most of the time. Things get spooky when after describing Tosh Raka, the book ends by featuring a supposed quote that this god dragon said. Quote, first, Tosh Raka says, is that we kill all the vampire snakes. Then, the tiger dragon emperor wants to invade Tamriel. End quote. This is literally the final sentence in Mysterious Akavir. It's a cliffhanger. No further elaboration or context is offered. Which is really odd, right? Because the book seems to indicate Akatosh is planning to invade Tamriel from Akavir. Something that doesn't make a lot of sense considering Akatosh is a god. So surely something's a bit jumbled and this isn't a perfect description of events. But whatever's the case, I think it's safe to say that something weird is definitely going on in Akavir. Next on our list, let's cut the history and talk more about Skyrim in the present. Shortly after the player discovers that they're a dragonborn, the ancient order of voice masters known as the Greybeards will summon us to their mountain fortress of High Hrothgar, promising to teach us what they know and assist with halting the recent return of the dragons. However, before they fully commit to helping us, they'll first demand the Dovahkin complete a specific test. They want us to journey to the tomb of the Greybeard's founder, a man named Jurgen Windcaller, and locate a horn that he was allegedly buried with. This is the basis for the quest, the Horn of Jurgen Windcaller. Long story short, we eventually do locate the horn, spoiler alert, it's not actually in the tomb, and return it to the Beards to complete the quest and secure their allegiance. Now, the material and origins of the horn, nor its exact capabilities, are ever explained to us. However, context clues suggest it's actually made from a hollowed out piece of the dragon Parthernax's own horn. Indeed, it's visually consistent with what we know dragon horns look like. And if we examine the head of Parthernax, you'll notice he's missing a part of his right horn. Heck, the colors even match. Given the fact that Parthernax is loyal to the Greybeards and was a known companion of Jurgen Windcaller's back in the day when the Greybeards were created, it does really make sense how the man could have ended up with this item. Maybe Parthernax volunteered part of his horn and gave it to- we don't know why, but it seems rather obvious. The connection is here. It's never explicitly confirmed by Bethesda, but it seems very probable. And I think the fact that they don't point it out to our face makes the detail even a bit better. Coming in at number three, female dragons are... a thing. Apparently. Maybe. Okay. So, for the most part, the genders of dragons in Skyrim have largely remained just as ambiguous as their exact origins. Given the fact it seems they're all directly created by Akatosh himself, and totally incapable of reproduction, then genders, biologically speaking, would be kind of pointless, right? Nonetheless, all the Dovas we encounter have rather deep voices, and often refer to themselves as he's. So, they've at least always been presented to be more masculine. Enter Michael Kirkbride, a former Bethesda Game Studios writer who contributed extensively to The Elder Scrolls' lore, and left the studio following the release of Morrowind, yet still continued to write Elder Scrolls lore and stories anyway, in the form of various in-universe books and scripts. Pretty much any of his work following his departure from the studio can and should be technically considered fan fiction, and not true canon. But either way, this fan fiction being written by a guy who's so deep on the inside and genuinely contributed to the actual lore should be taken a little bit more seriously. And indeed, much of what Kirkbride's written about has ended up becoming true in later games. Regardless, in his texts, he mentions a type of creature called Jills, 
that are female dragons. He doesn't mention them very often, they've only appeared in a couple of posts in 2010, though Jules are regarded as being much less aggressive than their male counterparts, and primarily spend their time repairing breaks in the Elder Scrolls' timeline. They are children of Akatosh, after all, the god of time. Furthermore, there's a book that appeared in the Elder Scrolls Online called A Child's Tamriel Bestiary, which lists many of the creatures that inhabit Tamriel in alphabetical order, and provides a brief description appropriate for a kid. So, just to prove a point, here's how it starts. Quote, A is for Alit, a two-legged lizard, with enough underbite to swallow a wizard. B is for Bankin, a mean Daedric minion, whose masters are found on the plains of Oblivion. C is for Charis, a big bug of the snip. You get the idea. Well, as you might imagine, providing translations of this book that accurately maintain the proper creature names in foreign languages proved tricky for the writers, and translations of the book are riddled with all sorts of odd alterations and mistakes. Though in the French translation, for the letter J, Jills are mentioned, saying in English, quote, J is for Jills, mythical beings. They fix the world when the dragon breaks. End quote. So not only are Jills mentioned in Kirkbride's musings, but they do even come up in official Elder Scrolls games. At least in the French version, if only for a bit. So, I suppose dragons really do have genders. Probably. Maybe. For a fourth spot, nearby the small hamlet of Rorikstead, players can find a shrine of Akatosh atop a large hill. And presented on that shrine as an offering of sorts are some dragon scales. Now, seeing this for the first time, you may not think anything of it. Dragons are the children of Akatosh. It's reasonable that someone would leave dragon scales at one of his shrines. I mean, heck, maybe it was a dragon who came to the shrine and peeled off one of his scales as a gift of sorts. But here's the problem. By the time the events of Skyrim take place, it's been so long in Tamriel's recorded history since a dragon was merely sighted that most people don't even believe the creatures were real in the first place, assuming them to be make-believe in fantasy. So, if someone did have access to dragon scales, definitive proof that dragons existed, surely they wouldn't want to waste them by putting them here, at a random shrine to Akatosh. They'd want to keep them as a collectible, or sell them for a huge price. Seeing that these are here since the start of the game implies that they were already placed before the reappearance of Alduin. So, maybe Parthernax could be responsible? We know he's been in Skyrim for the last few thousand years, living under the protection of the Greybeards. But even then, it doesn't make sense that he'd risk himself to so much exposure by flying to this wide-open shrine and leaving an offering. So, what happened here remains a really big mystery. And honestly, I can't even think of any probable theories that stand and hold up to reason. Seeing as this is the only way in the entire game we can acquire dragon scales without looting them off of a dragon's body, I assume Bethesda put them here on purpose? But maybe it was a developer mistake. Oh well, I guess only Todd Howard knows. And Todd Howard won't tell. And finally, last on our list, I want to end today's video by discussing Ysgrimor, a man revered by all Nords, and one of Skyrim's most notable historical figures, who was basically the land's founding father. And I want to specifically talk about why I, and many others believe, he might have been a dragon priest. Or dragonborn, or associated with dragons in some way. Let me explain. Ysgrimor was a man who lived way back in the late Merethic era, during that period in time in which Atmoran Nords were sailing south and migrating to Skyrim. Well, as the Nords were arriving, they found that Skyrim was already occupied by a large, advanced civilization of elves called the Falmer, or Snow Elves, who already had cities, towns, and armies of their own. At first, everything suggests humans and elves had a great relationship. The elves appear to have allowed the human beings to build colonies and outposts in their land, and there was a lot of positive trade. The biggest human colony that would be established was a place called Sarthal, that Ysgrimor was the ruler of. We're not quite sure how Ysgrimor styled himself, whether he called himself the King of Sarthal or the Governor of Sarthal, 
but it's obvious he was in charge. Anyway, despite these seemingly peaceful relations, one night, for a still unknown reason, a large Snow Elven army launched a surprise attack on Sarthal. They easily overpowered the obviously unprepared defenders and killed almost every single inhabitant. Yskrimor, and possibly a few of his sons, are the only people known to have escaped the slaughter. After this horrifying atrocity, Yskrimor sailed back to Atmora and vowed vengeance. Once he arrived on his homeland continent, he gathered 500 of the greatest warriors he could find, then took that army and sailed back to Skyrim, vowing to wipe the Snow Elven race out entirely. And believe it or not, despite having just 500 men, that's almost exactly what he did. Somehow, they totally defeated every single Snow Elven army, and then started killing not only the soldiers, but the women, and children, and the elderly. Innocent non-combatants. Every elf had to die, they reasoned. We know a small percentage of the elven population was able to survive after accepting shelter from the dwarves, who did their own nasty things, but sure enough, for the most part, the elves were driven to extinction. Soon after that, Skyrim was declared a land for the Nords and humans, and Yskrimor would die peacefully a few years later. Thus, that's how this man became one of the world's most iconic figures. Okay, Nate, so an interesting story, but where does it connect with dragons? All I heard about was Nords killing things. Well, the first thing to consider is that while Yskrimor did, for the most part, take over Northern Tamriel, he never crowned himself king or turned Skyrim into a kingdom. In fact, it's after Yskrimor's death that we start to see references to the dragon cult pop up. It seems that after he died, what was next for Skyrim was ruled by the dragons. Frustratingly, it's not clear how the dragons took over, if there was this single moment when the dragon said, we're in charge now or something. But remember, earlier in this video, we mentioned that the Atmoran Nords already did have some contact with the Dovas. And it's possible that during the time of Ysgrimor, the dragons were already in charge to begin with. He was simply one of their dragon priests, a human being that ruled in their name. This would explain why he never crowned himself king, why we're unsure what his title in Sarthal was, and it would even explain why he was able to take over Skyrim with only 500 troops. If dragons were assisting in this whole campaign, it makes a lot more sense how 500 boys could devastate an entire society. Furthermore, in Ysgrimor's own tomb, we find on many of the doors a dragon insignia. Now, these weird-looking dragon doors are used on a lot of tombs and ancient ruins in Skyrim, so it's not confirmation enough, but it's important to note. Furthermore, we can also visit the tomb of one of Ysgrimor's sons in Skyrim, Yingle, and in that tomb, there's a dragon puzzle door we have to open. Basically, one of those doors where we have to get one of the dragon claws and use it as a key, you know what I mean. That indicates, almost for sure, unless it's a developer oversight, that during Ysgrimor's time, he had knowledge of the dragons, at minimum. Then, there's a tablet we can find in an old Dwemer ruin that was written by the dwarves at the time of the Nordic invasion. And the dwarves described the Atmorans as the quote-unquote snow-throated kings of Mora, indicate that these invaders were using dragon shouts. Could Ysgrimor have been dragon shouting at the elves? Heck, maybe he's not a dragon priest, Maybe he was a dragonborn. Or maybe those snow-throated kings are a reference to actual dragons. Finally, and I promise I'll stop now, dragon influence could also explain the brutality demonstrated by Ysgrimor's army. Remember, they were killing innocents, women, children, people who didn't need to die. Like, I get it, the elves betrayed you, but, you know, murdering a six-year-old boy that had no knowledge of the plot doesn't help. It just seems like an act of evil. If Ysgrimor was loyal to the Dovas and acting on their will, or shared the Dragonborn himself, then that makes more sense. Maybe, just maybe, even well before humankind set foot on Skyrim, they were already being ruled by the dragons. Or maybe Ysgrimor's just a bit of a very smart maniac. Whatever the truth is, we'll probably never know for sure. But it's always fun to speculate.
And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five things you probably never knew about the dragons of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks so much for stopping by, everybody. Which of these fun facts or tiny details was your own personal favorite? And what Easter eggs do you know of in Skyrim or Fallout or any other games that I've yet to tackle? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.